Hi, everyone. I'm James Patrick Herman. I'm a contributor to Variety, and it's my pleasure to introduce Oscar-winning actor and director Timothy Hutton. So your father was an actor, and I'm curious, did that influence uh, your decision to become an actor at all? I loved how you thanked him in your Oscar speech. It was such a beautiful moment. Yeah, he, he def well, he was because um, he enjoyed the work so much. So I think that was a big influence when I was a kid, and I, we would go visit him. He did a couple of movies with John Wayne, and I remember going to one called Hell Fighters. And... Um, it just his love of what he did and uh, the camaraderie on set and uh, the process of building a scene and working with other actors. He he really loved that so much. I mean, uh, and um, had such joy in it. Uh, and then later, we did a he did a series called uh, Ellery Queen, and um, he asked to actually live at the studio, Lucille Ball's old bungalow. Uh, he asked if he could use that as his residence while making the, uh, which was great, except weekends, because uh, the gates were locked, so we would have to climb over the thing to go out to get food and stuff. But but he just loved it so much. He loved it. So, yeah, he was definitely an influence that way. I'm just curious, when you were a kid, what did you think his job involved? You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, because every job, every role or whatever was so different, it was... It was kind of hard to determine, but it just seemed as I'm, I, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but he, he just, it involved a lot of fun and a lot of um, love and a lot of care and um, a lot of disappointment. Um, you know, there were good years and not so, so good years and uh, good experiences and some less so. So it was, um, but it's all I knew as a kid. You know, now on one, at, in terms of one parent, my mom was a school teacher. It was a very balanced uh, prof uh, job, and she loved it as well, and she took great joy in it as well. And she, but it was way more consistent. And it, you know, we knew that in September that's when she started back up, and June, July would be done. She'd be free in the summer. So I guess I sort of had a little bit of a balanced kind of outlook as far as what work means. <laughs> yeah. You've worked with so many brilliant directors over the course of your career. I'm curious, who were some of your, your favorites and why? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, the, f the first job I did um, was th th there was a British director named David Green who directed Friendly Fire. Carol Burnett was in it and uh, Ned Beatty and Sam Waterston. Uh, TV movie for ABC and he, he was really the first uh, director that had great impact uh, just in terms of um, the way he kind of guided the actors and um, talked about the script and said just the right thing to you to get you and I was 18 years old and I I just really appreciated um, you know how much I learned from him and then the next year it was Robert Redford on Ordinary People and he was incredible I mean just amazing um, working with the actors and again the way he communicated that became kind of a big thing you know if a person could communicate well that was at least half the they could say the right thing Although, didn't Robert Redford tell everyone to ignore you yeah on that set <laughs> yeah well <laughs> yeah he sort of did no but he did he, he I found out that I found out uh, about that later and he kind of went to some of the key people and some of the key actors, and he said it would be a great idea if you just kind of, you know, didn't socialize too much with Tim, kind of, you know, isolate him a little bit, make him feel uh, uncertain. Um, and I kind of felt like that was kind of going on uh, a little bit. And then came Judd Hirsch, and he completely ignored Redford. He was just, you know, he was just like, uh, come on, let's go, let's go find a place to play play ping pong or whatever, you know, um, or let's work on the scenes. Uh, so even though he did that, you know, he had sort of a strategy of how he was going to kind of um, get, keep me in the bubble, so to speak. He, he, uh, he was also very warm and, and very great communicator and always checking in with 
uh, with me in terms of like how I was doing and how I was feeling about how things were going. But right, so Sidney Lamette, working with him was incredible. Did two movies with him. Uh, just an amazing director. Um, and then um, uh, John Schlesinger of Falcon and the Snowman. That was, he was amazing. Um, much more blunt than, you know, he was the first kind of like, that was terrible, you know. I didn't believe, I didn't believe anything that you were doing there. That was just, you want to do it again? Only, you know, so it took a little getting used to, but but I really, I really appreciated it. I, I, I did because he had a great sense of humor and, and he, we had two week rehearsal period, Sean Penn and I with him and so he was, that's when we got to know him and we just thought, okay, and we would pull out of, our, the, our rehearsal place was at the, you know, the, the Veterans Hospital, um, uh, Wilshire and San Vicente, just as you're kind of coming out of Westwood and you're going, that whole complex, somehow they, they had a, a building there or a room there and that's where we rehearsed and, and we used to uh, uh, drive out of there thinking, wow, this is, he's really tough. But he was also really funny and we appreciated how blunt he was. It was kind of very refreshing because um, he really cared about us and we knew that. So, um, And uh, Alan Rudolph was another one. Sorry, you asked like, yeah. Yeah. I'm going on and on about these different, but uh, they were definitely um, directors. That John Ridley recently on American Crime was, uh, that was a very special experience. Um, and uh, And I just had the, uh, great uh, pleasure of working with Leslie Headland on um, a pilot I did that got picked up. Uh, she um, was responsible, f um, uh, along with others, of uh, Russian Doll. And she's an amazing director. Rachel Morrison on American Crime, was, that was a great experience. And Nicole Cassell, uh, Anyway, I think that's that's a that's a good firm. Sorry, I went on and on. <laughs> when you ha have had a four decades long career, it must you know, I'm sure you have a lot of favorites. Ted Demi, Beautiful Girls, he was incredible, just incredible. He just created an environment, an atmosphere that everybody just was so happy to be there and to give their all, and um, and that was an amazing cast uh, of people to be able to work with. So, um, so. Obviously, Robert Redford's technique worked because you won the Oscar for Ordinary People. What do you, and you're one of the youngest ever Oscar winners, what do you recall from that night, or is it just all a big blur? Yeah, big blur. <laughs> I mean, it was, uh, it's funny how you remember these these little funny little details. Like, I remember <clears throat> um, Mary Tyler Moore and uh, Jack Lemmon were presenting that category. Uh, and um, and I remember uh, they opened the envelope, and um, before Mary Tyler Moore said the name, I was like sitting down there, and she said, and she she kind of you know she read the thing, and then she kind of looked at me and went, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was a kind of like you know don't worry, it's okay, you know, it's not going to, but then she said my name, and I just felt frozen. I remember that really well, and then I remember getting up, and then uh, um, Peter O'Toole was sitting right in front of me, and, and I remember, um, and my dad, he and my dad were friends, so I remember I sort of awkwardly kind of like clapped, like, you know, went like, you know, on his shoulder, like, like... <laughs> It, I don't know what it meant, but I kind of like, <laughs> like we did it kind of thing. Um, but he was great. And then, then the last thing was, uh, Redford was sitting over here. And these, again, these things you remember, I went to shake his hand before I went up to the stage and I tripped. And yeah, and Redford just kind of like, luckily I tripped when our hands were linked. And he just kind of went, you know, and just... Kind of sent me on my way, you know. That's yeah. beautiful. Is there footage of that? <laughs> yeah. Can we find that on YouTube? Oh, it's it's. I think it's in there somewhere. You kind of. And he has this look like, don't fall. <laughs> so. How how did winning that Oscar at such a young age change change your career, or change you? Well, in terms of work, I mean, you know, uh, it, it was. 
it, it suddenly, I mean, I'll give one specific example. I was, I was uh, already scheduled to do um, uh, taps. And um, when that happened, not, 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 not uh, after the Academy Awards, but when nominations came out and all that sort of stuff, uh, I was originally supposed to play the part that, uh, one of the other parts. And when Ordinary People came out and they got nominated and all that, um, they asked me to play the lead. So it's stuff like, you know, that was, and I just thought, and I, I didn't understand at the time that it was because of Ordinary People. I, I sort of instantly went to, wow, I guess they don't think I'm right for that role, you know, the one I'm supposed to play. So I took it as a kind of like, huh, I wonder what happened. I was supposed to play this and then, so I, I kind of misunderstood the whole thing. Um, but in terms of like, on a personal level, um, or even personal and work level, uh, I sort of thought to myself at the time that it was best to just think about the Academy Award and, and, and the film getting that kind of attention as something that was very specific to that film. And that the best thing I could do would be to um, have that as the association, and then once it was all done, uh, and I was flying to Pennsylvania to begin TAPS, to have the mindset that none of that had happened and that I was starting something entirely new and something I had never done before in terms of the character, in terms of the film, the story, the actors I was working with. It was all a completely new uh, experience and that it was the beginning and that I couldn't take anything with me except experience and you know things like that and things that worked for me in terms of how I went about the process, sure, but all of the other stuff I, I wanted to kind of leave in its own place directly related to a film and that's it. I always like to ask Oscar winners, where do you keep your Oscar? Um, well, my, my sister a couple of years ago uh, thought it would be a great idea before a party to put it in the refrigerator. So it sort of has stayed. Yeah, so I thought, not bad, you know, um, not a bad spot. <laughs> I mean, I know where it is. <laughs> so again, she's always, she always asks me, and, and uh, so I just decided to sort of, it has a certain spot, upstate New York, um, and uh, yeah, so that, that, yeah. So let's go back to... To Taps in 1981, you made with Tom Cruise and Sean Penn, and the three of you have all gone on to have very successful but but very different careers. What do you recall of filming that movie? So Giancarlo Esposito. Yes. Yeah, and um, Evan Handler. Um, really incredible. What did you? Uh, sorry, I was oh, thinking I about guess, those guys. Uh, what fond memories do you have of filming that? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, working with all of them, um, I, it, it filled with. I mean, we could we could talk about the experience of making that movie for a long time. One of the things I remember about that was during rehearsal, uh, all of us were sitting around the table um, that were, uh, you know, playing the speaking parts, and then Harold Becker, who was another great director to work with. Uh, had a group of local cadets and local actors from the area, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania. He had, he sort of handpicked a bunch of actors that would kind of sit in chairs just outside of this big, massive table. And there was an actor who was playing the, the main guy, with the Red Beret. And uh, we were reading through the script. We were doing a table read, and Harold Becker didn't think that it was working. He was trying to fire this guy up. And the guy just was either he was nervous or, you know, as we all were, but that can be such a, as you guys know, it's, a, it's such an awkward kind of, you don't know whether to bring it or lay back. So this guy was, you know, he wasn't going for it. He wasn't shouting. He wasn't, you know, being the kind of gung-ho. So Harold Becker finally on the third day said, uh, all right, all right, I'm going to, you know, I want to get someone else to read this thing. And he kind of looked around and he said, you, come here. And um, this guy got up, he said, I want you to read the role, take that seat. And you, the guy who was cast, you go sit in that chair. So the guy he was just, that was just picked, that was sitting in the back, came and he sat down. And Harold Becker said, what's your name? And he said, Tom Cruise. <laughs> yeah, 
And so, unfortunately, the other actor was replaced. But this guy, Tom Cruise, and, and, and no one heard from him again. <laughs> Speaking of Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise, you, I mean. you turned down Risky Business, uh, which I think is a shame because it would have been fun to see you dancing in your underwear, I'm sure. Um, why did you turn it down? Because of that scene? No. <laughs> uh, no, there was, there was uh, at the same moment that that script, uh, that I was reading that script, uh, this, this uh, other script um, came my way. Which was is, it Daniel? It was Daniel. And it, Sidney Lamet was going to be directing it in New York City. E.L. Doctorow wrote the script, the adaptation based on his book, fictional account of the Rosenbergs. Everything about it was just kind of, I started reading it, and um, Sidney Lamette wanted, uh, you know, wanted me to come back and um, meet him. Um, and uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't that I had the opportunity to do either movie. Sidney Lamette wasn't saying, it's, it's yours. It wasn't like an offer or anything. Um, he just said, I'm interested in you playing this role. Would you come to New York and meet and discuss it? Um, but Risky Business was, was there, and it was, everybody thought I was insane, you know, to, because all I had to do was say, yes, I like it, I'd like to do it. But I kept holding it off and saying, I really want to go to New York and, and meet, meet Sydney. And uh, finally, I, had to ma- I remember I had to make a decision. Like, they weren't going to wait any longer. Right, rightly so, and I said, um, "Okay, um, I, I'm going to go to New York, and I'm going to, you know, I, I really want to get that role." Uh, so, so you know, it could have been that either, neither uh, was going to happen. But fortunately, it worked out with Sydney and um, uh, my agent at the time, Sue Mengers, thought I was out of my mind. Uh, and she was probably right. No, but I don't know. She, so that that's how it happened. And and I think that, you know, I don't think I was right for that role. Uh, it was an amazing movie, and Tom was so incredible in in, in that role. Um, I think I would have tonally <laughs> just been kind of off somehow. I don't know, maybe I would have found the right thing, but... I really felt good about the decision because Daniel was one of the great experiences of my life, making that movie and working with Sydney. Um, but the other side of it is that I, I just don't, I just didn't, I couldn't relate to it, really. I appreciated it. Like reading the script, that's an amazing script and funny and great story. And you could really see that that's a, that's a real movie there as opposed to like reading Daniel, which is so bleak and just relentlessly depressing. And so I went, yeah, I want that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in 1995, you made a romantic comedy, French Kiss. I'm just curious, why haven't you been attracted to do, doing more comedies? Um, I don't know. I, 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 I would love to. I just, uh, the opportunity to do, to do uh, you, know, um, you know, absolute comedy or it, it just hasn't. Um, I mean, there have been movies that are humorous or romantic comedy like French Kiss or funny scenes or circumstances but as far as uh it's just it's just the way it's gone um you know maybe uh you know maybe those things kind of change up as as you go through this kind of thing this this work i hope so it'd be fun to do something but um i just uh, i don't know do you remember the last time that you actually had to audition for a role sure um uh General's daughter. No, no, no. Um, that's not true. Uh, All the money in the world. Uh, Rid- Ridley Scott movie. Two years ago, uh, he was doing this movie about the Getty family. The one that originally had Kevin Spacey in it. That's right. right. And Christopher Plummer. Um, we redid all the scenes, but I got a message saying Ridley Scott is interested in you playing Getty's right hand man, his main lawyer, his kind of, you know. Um, pit bull lawyer kind of guy and um, and I thought oh that's great Ridley Scott that'd be amazing and then uh, you know the agent said yeah you got to go on tape wants to you know see you uh, do the role so uh, yeah so my cousin came over and you know suited up 
uh, slicked my hair back and tried to figure out some kind of interesting way to go about it. And then, and then I, <clears throat> I had a, I, I, uh, I had a beard and and everything at the time, so I just I shaved that off but left the mustache, and I thought, oh, that, this this would be good for the guy, <laughs> and. Uh, so uh, anyway, so that was the last time I auditioned. Anyway, the, the end of that is I got I got the part, and I was really excited. And I went to Rome to f- to film it. And the first day, um, meeting the makeup hair people and all that, uh, Ridley was on on set. I got a message through the makeup person saying Ridley would like you. And by this point, now the mustache had really grown out. And I thought, oh, I, I attributed my getting the role to the mustache, of course. <laughs> so I. Um, I got a message from the main makeup person saying, he really wants you to lose the mustache. And I was so attached to the mustache. And I, you know, had flown all this way and auditioned, and it just completely threw me off balance. I just, did, what, what am I going to do without the mustache? So I went to set, and everyone got really nervous, like, no, no, Ridley's working. He's, I said, no, I just want to ask, I just want to make a case for the mustache. So anyway, I talked to him he came out of the video village tent and he said uh they had someone had already radio ahead and said he's come to talk to you about the mustache <laughs> and I, and i so he knew and i was kind of like taken aback he he walked out of the thing and he said so you want the bloody mustache huh <laughs> and i said yeah and then i tried to explain why and uh, he went all right you can keep it so that was that was fun also worked extensively as a director, and I'm just curious, do you feel that that has made you a better actor? Well, I think, yeah, I think, in, I mean, I don't know about better actor, but certainly um, a more understanding actor, more kind of understanding of the process and understanding that what a director goes through and how a director, you know, pretty much has considered all the different options in terms of blocking and in terms of the way a scene can go and what the tone of the scene can be and what the values of the scene can be. So that I think that after the first time I directed, I thought it'd be really great if I just kind of understood that that a lot of the things that I want to ask about have already been asked and answered and just keep the ones that are really, really pertinent um, and save the director some time and make it make it brief and try to have private time with the director because you know public discussions on the set uh, asking about the character or about dialogue puts a tremendous amount of pressure on the director and if you can just simply get those questions out of way out of the way over a coffee somewhere or over the phone or over email even I kind of learned that and I thought I, I think that you know that helped me as, a, as an actor sort of um, you know, um, yeah. How did you end up coming to direct video, like music videos for the Cars and Don Henley in the 80s? And, and is it harder to direct musicians than actors? Hmm. No, I mean, not really. I mean, you know, they're, they're in their element. You just put a camera on them and um, tell them to play their song, uh, you know, and, and they get super into it. If anything, it's kind of like, no, no, you, you can just kind of just be. And, um, and during that time, videos were a new thing, and they were so excited. Musicians were so excited to make videos that it just was a great environment, a great atmosphere for uh, filming. But it came to be because I lived next door to um, the manager of the Cars, and he had some people in the neighborhood over to listen to a new album they had coming out. And um, and then he asked everybody what we all thought might be the hit. It was sort of like a you know a record listening party or whatever. And I said this, this, that I thought this song, the ballad Drive, was going to, was really a special song. And then, he's, and that was it. I left. And the next day he said, yeah, Rick Ocasek wants to talk to you about that song. He was the leader of the, uh, you know, cars. And so I got on the phone with him. And then he just said on the phone, he said, so you like that song, huh? He said, yeah. He said, you want to direct the video? So that, that's how it happened. I was, it was so much fun. So, of course, now I would love to talk about The Haunting of Hill House. You, you and Henry Thomas play two versions of the same character, which is so interesting. How did you two collaborate on that character, and what was your process 
like? Like, did you have discussions about, you know, character ticks and so forth? Yeah, we did. We had a meeting with Mike Flanagan, the director, very early on where we talked about who this guy was and what sort of things we could establish, uh, create a sense of continuity with the character. Um, so we all had ideas about that, and and um, and then Henry and I kind of talked about certain things, uh, you know. And I I would on my days off I would go and watch uh, Henry and his scenes with the kids and Carla, and I would just watch him, um, watch how he was with them, and um, he's such an amazing uh, actor, Henry, and I just so I just you know, did a little of that and we talked about it and there were things like the, the makeup department and Mike thought it would be a good idea if Henry had blue eyes um, and uh, that we both had blue eyes. Uh, and then there was one idea I had about a, uh, that there would be one article of clothing that made it from younger Hugh to older Hugh. And it ended up being this really odd red corduroy jacket blazer. And Henry wears it early in one of the early episodes, and then I wear it in episode five when Nell is is getting married. Uh, so there was one piece of clothing that just kind of bridges the two the two people playing the same role. But it was really fun because I mean, Henry's whole thing was to be really all about the kids and about his wife and about taking care of the the house and 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 comforting them when they were afraid. All this crazy stuff happening in the house and. And I thought, well, that's great. He's so committed to that that, and my character, after shit hits the fan, you know, when things go bad with the house, kind of abandons them. So everything that Henry did in terms of being really specifically engaged, I'll just do pull back because it's been years since he's seen them. So he's afraid of the confrontation that he might happen with them, which of course does happen. And he doesn't have the skill, he doesn't have the tools to listen to them and to tell them what happened, answer their questions. As the show goes on, he gets better at it, but it just, um, the contrast seemed to be you know, right there and just, just there to, to, to try to do in the playing. Let's talk about episode six, which is comprised of five very long takes. The creator said, it almost killed him. What was it like for you and the cast? Well, it was incredible. I mean, it was it was so interesting to do. We 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 rehearsed it for two weeks. Um, everything was mapped out. Uh, long discussions about uh, you know what Mike Flanagan was looking for, and um, and then we get it. We got into the physical space, and then we just started running it for three days, and then we ran it with a steady cam operator. Um, and then we were supposed to film the first 19 minute shot, I think on a Friday. But Tuesday night, we all felt like we were ready. So everyone made the decision. We, we went to Mike Flanagan, we said, can we do that first shot tomorrow? And it was scheduled to be Friday and we ended up doing it Wednesday and we did it in three takes. And we, we had it in the second take, but he wanted to do one more. And then the dolly, um, the wheels of the dolly basically collapsed after the third take. So they had to fix that. And then next day we did the second long take. And I mean, it was, um, yeah, this episode was really just a blast to do, but also in intense pressure. Nobody wanted to be the one who forgot their line or, you know, or, or went to the wrong spot or went up on the line, you know. So, Everybody was just in sort of you know high alert kind of kind of state of mind. And I guess that's what's fascinating, you know, because that must have caused a lot of anxiety. And you have such an, a deeply emotional performance when you walk in. You carry so much grief and sadness, and it's palpable. I guess how how did you you know reconcile the anxiety you must have felt with like getting all the choreography right with also delivering this intensely emotional performance? I guess I guess I just kind of used it and and tried to channel it into anxiety about seeing my kids again instead of you know we rehearsed it so much we did the movement so much that I think everybody by the time we started filming nobody was worried about blocking nobody was worried about dialogue you know we had we had those two things and those two things were you know 
pretty in pretty good shape. Um, you know, it, there was anxiety about yeah, but it always can happen. You know, someone can be in the wrong place at the wrong time or forget their line or something like that. But that that didn't happen. Everything was so precise. The um, so yeah, I just felt like it was important to walk through that door and to see see my kids and then there's this really interesting camera shot where you know when it turns around and it's the young kids and then turn and without a cut now the adults are there again and i thought with the character it was so beautifully written that um he could he could be in a state of just not knowing what to do or what to say and and then not not having anything kind of take hold of him until he gets to the coffin and then things happen for him, things change for him so it everybody had such a crystal clear map of the emotional journey that uh they were supposed to go on every character and every actor had that and as long as everyone stayed true to that which they did then it was all going to kind of work I, everyone felt this show, more than any other I can think of, plays with time in a way that as a viewer, I felt like I was solving a puzzle as I watched it. What do you think about that storytelling technique as an, as an actor? Oh, I think it's great when you get to see where a person was, where they're going, and then jump back and see the different um, little things that kind of inform where they are. I mean, it's a great, it's a great way, and it particularly works well, I think, in this series. Uh, because the kids are so specific in terms of, you know, what kind of uh, trauma they they each have, and it's a different each one has a different type of trauma, and then and then you transfer that to them as adults, and then you go back again and you start to learn more about them, and then you go to the adult and say, ah, that's why they're making that choice, and that's why they're this way. So it's a great way to. Um, I think ha have the audience feel compelled by the storytelling and the characters because um, you become really invested in the entire history of of an individual and and in this case group of siblings and the parents and so it can be if done right it can be very powerful why do you think the horror genre is so popular right now and and why do you think this show in particular has resonated with so many people um, I don't know why it's so popular right now. I think, um, um, I don't know. I don't know if that's, if it's more popular now than it's ever been. I don't know. But I think that, I think when it's done in a way where it's not, it's not overtly just a horror story. It's a, it's a, it's a drama. It's a, it's a story about people that are broken and terrible things have happened and they're trying to find their way back to their lives or back to their relationships or and they're fragmented and disconnected and just complete mess if it's that kind of thing interpersonal relationships that are just completely falling apart and people in the state of crisis and then you add horror to that and paranormal and um, supernatural elements it will work because you're you're really invested in them as people and you're rooting for them to kind of pull out of it and and have the pain within them stop so that's what i think we all as actors approaching the, the this this project felt like it first and foremost was a family drama um deeply broken people that you know moved into this house and the house itself was this character that just was brought out all of the fear and the anxiety within each character this is actually one of three TV series that you shot last year, and you made, you were in the movie Beautiful Boy. How did you balance all of those TV series? Well, it um, it just the, the 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 timing all worked out um, pretty well. Uh, Honey Hill House finished in actually today is it, we wrapped a year ago precisely on this day is when we finished finished that. Um, and then, you know, I had a little time off, and I started something else, and then I did a pilot with Diane Lane, this interesting thing that's going to come out uh, later called Why Last Man Standing. Um, and then, but that, you know, I had time off, so I was able, it all just worked out. 
My last question for you, you've been working nonstop in Hollywood now for four decades. What advice do you have for our audience in terms of sustaining such a long and fulfilling career in Hollywood? Um, to, 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 to really uh, stay with the, the idea of why you, you know, fell in love with it in, in, in the first place and to, um, I don't know, I mean, it, there's a there's something about really understanding what uh, what it, what attracts you to anything and and why people feel compelled to um, be storytellers through acting um, and it's a really an amazing thing it's an exciting thing to do and it doesn't matter where it's done how it's done uh, you know if you get something out of it it's it's, it's just a it can be an incredible, uh, incredible experience continuously for a long period of time. Um, it's a, it's a be very special thing, I think, to have those feelings and those, that desire to, to do it. And if you, I think, if, if we all kind of remember that and are inspired to do it and up for doing it and know what comes along with it, uh, then it can, yeah, it can really give a lot back. And then we had some great questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is, did you feel extra pressure taking on the role of a well-known character from a popular book by Shirley Jackson? Um, not really. Uh, I mean, I think some, you know, um, you know, fiction is fiction. It, it, I've done some things where people have a very strong idea of the person and the person actually existed and everything. When it comes to a book, yeah, yeah, this was a very, very known book, and the characters are very known, but um, I think that my reaction to, or anyone's reaction to reading Hugh Crane and knowing who this guy was would be fairly consistent across the board. So it wasn't like I was going to suddenly, you know, have him walk around playing the accordion and do all his lines of dialogue and song. You know, that would be like, wait, in the book, I don't remember the accordion and the... So as long as it was, you know, and the material is so specific that you just kind of um, honor it. And if you honor it, I think that, the, and you know that you're honoring it, then the pressure goes away. Uh, another question, what would 10-year-old Timmy feel about this role? Did you have any fears at that age? I know I'm not 10, but I've had really scary nightmares about the bent neck lady. Uh, Ten-year-old, I, I would, uh, I mean, my mom thought it was a good idea when I was eight years old to take me to a ghost hunting um, kind of program that this couple, famous couple in Connecticut, they would go around and they would try to get ghosts out of people's houses and they would film video of it and then recordings and and so she thought, she was really fascinated by that stuff and so she brought me to one of those things and I, and, uh, so I was I was eight then. So by the time I was ten, I had already experienced a couple of those things because she would follow these uh, these people, this this couple, and they you know they would talk about getting rid of ghosts and all of that stuff. And there was one time, the first time, um, the the woman was up on stage and she was kind of it felt like she was staring at me or looking at me too much. And I remember just trying to kind of find a way that to kind of not have that happen anymore. And then when the when it was over, uh, when that particular event was over, uh, she she came, she made a beeline down from the stage and she came over to my mom and and she started talking to my mom and then went away and then in the car ride home, my mom said, that uh, lady wants to know if you want to go with them on a, uh, into a house and see if you can find ghosts. <clears throat> and I, didn't say anything and uh and then she said well think about it you know and i think like next day or something i said yeah i think i'd like to do that i mean my, i don't remember i remember going to the thing but i don't remember the car ride home and i don't remember saying yeah i'd like to do it my mom says that i said i'd like to do that so i went and they brought and this part i remember too they brought me into a house and they said can you just walk through the house and tell us if any rooms feel cold or weird to you strange to you 
so I did that, and and then they like brought me to get ice cream or something, and I thought it was really fun. And then my mom asked me what happened, and she was mortified. I don't know what she thought would happen, but when I told her I was brought around different rooms, she said, like, they sent you down to the basement by yourself? I said, yeah. And she just thought, I think she then realized that this is a really bad idea. <laughs> so that didn't happen anymore. So anyway, the 10-year-old would be like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> sure. And the last question, I think, is a great way to end this. Your, uh, with every role, your vulnerability is almost unmatched. Are you so sensitive in real life? Don't get me wrong, it's a beautiful quality. That's nice. Um, <laughs> well, that's really nice. Um, I, I, I think it's a nice. I think it's a nice thing too. Uh, uh, you know, um, if. If, if vulnerability means, you know, being open to receiving what's happening in the world and, you know, um, being aware of what other people are uh, experiencing and being aware of what you're experiencing and not trying to push it away and being, you know, allowing yourself to be affected by things, then yeah, I guess I, guess I am. But, but um, you know, sometimes, sometimes I'm not. I think everybody kind of goes through you know um times when you can't be you have to be you have to have a thick skin about things you can't you can't be you can't walk around in this world being vulnerable to everything it's just it's uh boy especially now and especially in hollywood yeah. uh, thank you again for your time and for sharing your experiences it's been such a pleasure